Welcome to another edition of Wake Up the Echoes presented by Tyrac.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone. Great to have you back for another jam-packed show. We had the head coach, as always, Micah Shrewsbury. We talked a lot about All-Star Weekend in the NBA. Notre Dame did not have a game this weekend, which gave us all a chance to kind of take in the festivities. So we talked to Micah Shrewsbury about it. Then later we brought in forward Tay Davis and got his thoughts on kind of how All-Star Weekend has changed over the years. Also had a chance to talk to him about high school basketball in the state of Indiana where he grew up. He really listed off some great players that he's seen in his time. Finally, at the end of the show, what a special guest. Lafonso Ellis, of course, everyone around the program knows Lafonso. He had some great stories to share with us. It was great to catch up with him and see how he's doing. He, of course, lives locally, so it was great to talk to Fonz and cover a ton of different topics on this week's episode of Wake Up the Echoes. So let's talk to the head coach, Michael Shrewsbury. All right, Coach, welcome back. Another show, no game this past weekend. You guys had the the weekend off, but there was plenty of hoops on the national level, NBA All-Star Weekend. We're going to talk a little bit about it later with one of our guests this week, Tay Davis, about the All-Star Game. I, I didn't realize, but you coached in it, too, as an assistant back in the day. But let's talk three-point contest first. I think three-point contest moments, I think about Larry Bird putting it up when he knocks yeah. down the three. I think about my guy, J.J. Redick, with his foot on the line in Brooklyn 10 years ago bothering me. But last night, or Saturday night, Steph and Sabrina, kind of a unique situation. What was your takeaway from that three-point contest they really put on the show? It was uh, it was actually a great, like, after the initial three-point contest where there were a lot of guys that were, like, tying and were close, and they had to do a – first time I've ever seen, like, a shoot-off to get to the finals. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was, like, really good, and then – you know, Steph and Sabrina get up there. And to think about, one, how long they sat out there and watched. Yeah. Right? They had to sit and watch the entire <laughs> get cool. point contest. They get cold. They talk to them, and then they give them, like, a minute to warm up. Mm-hmm. So they're, like, frantically shooting threes from, like, the ball racks to get loose. Yeah. And then they go. And um, Sabrina was like, starts out on fire hey <laughs> like right away yeah. the the first corner first spot I'm like oh man I you know yeah you know, I didn't see the WNBA all-star game but I, you know everybody's seen the highlights yeah um but like I was like she's gonna put up one of those numbers like yeah. she's gonna be close to 37 and she cooled off a bit but you knew that like Steph going second advantage he knew the number they need to get right it's like uh my home's in the Super Bowl, right? Like, <laughs> I know back. what number I need to get. Yeah. Like, and he's he's the he's the greatest shooter of all time. And, yeah. And uh, that there was no doubt in my mind he was getting it done. Okay, interesting statement there. So if he's the greatest shooter of all time, I'm going to ask you, who's the second greatest shooter of all time in your head? That's a good question. I got a couple um, of mine. And, you know, and this isn't just because of the numbers, but – you know, Ray Allen, Reggie Miller, right? Those guys are are there. I grew up watching Reggie Miller, being a Pacer fan and being in Indianapolis. So watching him and, you know, he can move and shoot. Like, he can run and shoot. That's the one thing is, like, there are good shooters. And then there's, like, standstill shooters. Like, sure. these guys can shoot on the move. All due respect to Kyle Korver, but Reggie Miller and Ray Allen were moving a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Cal Corver could move and shoot too. Okay, you so is JJ Redick, right? We, JJ's we, great off the move. I we think. played against them yeah. in the playoffs. Series, okay, so you think so Corver's like, better at shooting off the move than I'm giving him credit for? Yeah, he he's good. All he's good on the move. Okay, as well. I'll take yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll take anybody your, that can that can make it to that level of college basketball or that level of the NBA. Yeah, they got to be able to to do both. There's no there's no like one trick pony shooters in the in the NBA. Wasn't the year that Corver made the All-Star game, wasn't he shooting close to like 50% from three at some point in that season? I think so. It was the the Hawks were fantastic during that time. 2014-15, I think. Yeah, I think they may have had four guys make the All-Star team. I think it was. And they were they were like the one seed. Uh, they were Horford and all those guys. All right, let's talk about your team a little bit. This past uh, Wednesday, I thought another great performance – I like that kind of win. I thought that was a win that maybe a couple weeks earlier would have gone the other way. What What about the way you guys won without shooting made you happy as the head coach? Uh, I I think 
just that, the toughness, the the kind of perseverance. Mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't perfect. We didn't start the second half great, right? And they went on a run, kind of took the lead, and we had to kind of <clears throat> fight back, scratch and claw to, to get it back to where, you know, we were ahead and in and, and control. But uh, it was. And, and there were, like, and we had some open shots, right? Just some open shots that we missed. Uh, but then we made some big ones. I thought, you know, JR's three late um, was a, you know, complete, I, I will admit this, complete sandlot play for us right okay. there. And uh, for him to come off and hit that three was big time. The, uh, with with JR hitting that three, it, it was, I think only three guys had multiple field goals. And he's a guy that the last couple of games had really just not looked like himself. I thought that was a really important game, an important shot for him. How good was it to see him step up in that moment, specifically just because of the way it had been going the last couple of games for him? Yeah, no, it was it was great. Um, just to see because he's worked so hard. Yeah, right. And he he puts he gets down on himself, hmm. you know, um, but he works so hard to to be good. And he's he's really been working like after practice, before practice. He and Coach Fairley have been putting a lot of time in together. And to see him, you know, knock a couple threes down is great for his confidence. Mm-hmm. And um, it was big. The hardest shot of the night for JR was like the like 12 footer. Like mm. yeah. nobody practices those or shoots those anymore. <laughs> it it I, I was telling the guys on staff, it was like a it was like, I don't know. I I guess if there are people that are um kids that still play video games watching this it's that shot was like I'm like driving the ball and I'm playing video games and I go to pass it and I accidentally hit the b button and the dude just jumps up and shoots it right like yeah. that's what it was right there it was like it wasn't an accident because they passed it to him at the end yeah but like if I was playing video games I'm like oh shoot 2K I didn't game. mean to do that. Yeah, the 2K glitch, yeah. basically. Yeah. And the dude just jumps up, knocks it in. You're like, okay, all right, all right, we're, we're fine here, we're fine. But I that was, was like a hard shot. Man, yeah. In the big moment. Oh yeah, no, it, the the that area of the floor, it's very unique. <laughs> I was talking to Tay when he came in here. I was asking if they play 2K much anymore, and he was saying they're off of it because it's not as good. It hasn't gotten any better over the last few years. Are you a 2K guy? I summertime. I'm a summertime 2K guy. Okay. Or if um, I haven't played it all this year, but I used to play when. Um, so this would have been a few years ago when Braden and Nick would have their friends over, and uh, I'd go down and play every once in a while with them, and just you know, because they'd be playing each other, I'd jump in, come and play, because the buttons they haven't changed a whole lot. Yeah. But there, it it is a little bit different where it's a little harder, like to shoot and some of the that's other things. He, that's what Tay was saying. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you, you gotta like, you got practice a lot, and I'm not a I'm not a practice guy. I'm just go down there and, and wing it and play, and then I don't know how. Like, once it gets to the point where you just can't hit like A or B and go shoot a layup or dunk it, or you gotta like hit some other button and at the same time hit that, like, I'm off. I'm yeah. Uh, I'm they went, like, shooting stick for a while, too, didn't they? Yeah, that's that's too much. That's right too much. There. So do, who wins in those games, though? Are you be, going down there and teach uh, them a lesson, or do they? Not usually. Okay. Um, I try, you know. I am I'm i don't know how to pass. <laughs> so <laughs> I only know the one button pass, right? So it'll only throw it to the guy that's closest to you. Oh, so you don't have the direct pass? I no, think, I don't I think know it's how. Like to... Right, right bumper. Then I know what you're yeah, talking about. I don't so know how to do it. And you, you did the direct. So there's pass. like some dude, you know. For <laughs> me, I'm like passing the bunch, and it's like throwing it to some guy like next to me. And there's a dude at the rim, wide open, and I'm getting mad because I can't throw it to that guy. But like, so that part of it is tough. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and they probably don't like playing. They probably don't like playing against me because I'm out there trying to run fundamental team basketball in floppy floppy yeah we're moving the ball they they run plays right yeah like they run plays they know how to like iso you and they know how to call plays yeah and my team is just out there just passing it back and forth (laughs) and we're just running you know just swinging it back and forth to the same guy because i don't know how to pass and it only passes to the guy next to you and then next thing you know the shot clock runs down (laughs) i i I mean i guess it yeah we'll we'll get an xbox in here maybe one of these weeks and we can just See what, see what goes. People would say that's what our team does now. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh man, uh, I had another off the wall question. Let's just let's just keep it going here. I want to save my my other question for later in the year. But top of the head, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Best basketball movies. You mentioned Hoosiers earlier. What are the mm-hmm. basketball movies, whether it was growing up or even recently, that come to mind that you think are some of the the best basketball movies you've ever had? I wrote down a small list, but I want to hear what comes to mind for you first. I don't know if they're the the best basketball okay, movies. Favorite, favorite. favorite basketball movies. Um, all right, so I guess this is a basketball movie because they play basketball in it. I'm a big fan of, like, I love Above the Rim. Mm, okay. Sure. Fantastic soundtrack, too, <laughs> sure. by the way. But Above the Rim is a really good movie. Okay. Um, Blue Chips. Blue Chips. Blue Chips is a good movie. Yeah. Filmed in uh, in Frankfurt at the at the famous Case Arena there in Frankfurt, Indiana. That's right. Uh, Blue Chips. Um, Hoosiers, obviously, it's a good one. Um, Coach Carter. That's on Coach my list. Coach Carter's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Um, Glory Road. Glory Road, based on true story. Right. Based on yep. true story. Um, I don't know if I, there, there's probably others that I'm I've got two about. others I wrote down. <clears throat> I got what are your thoughts on Love and Basketball? Good movie. Good movie. Right? Good movie. Yeah. 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 Love and Basketball. My parents went to USC, so I was like, ah, USC. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. Notre Dame doesn't like USC. I get that, but you know. Yeah. And, and then I had He Got Game. He Got Game's a good one as well. You know, yeah. that's kind of like, mm-hmm. I mean, you go back and watch it. Ray Allen's like, I, mean, I don't want to, he's not out acting Denzel, obviously. Yeah. But he's holding up better than Ray Allen should hold up with Denzel, right? Right. It's kind of amazing. Good movie. Um, like, decent acting. <laughs> good movie. There were, there was a, uh, one, one year in the, um, now I forget the, the dad's name now. Um, Denzel's name. Oh I man, his I name in the movie. A- anybody got a name? Uh, I can't remember the names either. Uh, well, Jesus Shuttlesworth, but then yeah, uh, his dad. But that that like, I was him for Halloween. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came in to uh, Jake Shuttlesworth. Jake. I came in as Jake Shuttlesworth for Halloween one time with the Celtics. We had practice. <laughs> uh, I, I I I took it off. I didn't like wear it during practice, but. Uh, yeah, had the cut off had the cut off shirt with the shirt under. Yeah. Had the uh had the pair of those Jordans that he had on. I forget what, what year it was. Yeah. Had the, the the black shorts. And then I took like an old like um I had like an old iPod or something and uh taped it to my ankle. It was like the ankle monitor. <laughs> <laughs> and I had had a couple sheets of paper kind of rolled up in my hands and I'd I'd come around the corner, I'd see somebody. I was like, You st- St. Jesus, man, he was like looking. He kept asking, you know, because he needed him to sign the papers yeah. to go to the big state. So, wow, you were all in. On I went that all costume. in. Yeah, oh I went all gosh. in. Jake shoulders were. Oh my gosh, that's great! I got to see the photos. Uh, the 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 one on one scene at the end is great too. All right, last thing before we take a break and get Tay Davis in here, let's just talk a little bit about this road trip coming up. Two, I think, really good opportunities for you guys to get some. I think. Big time road wins in the conference. Just what are you hoping to see from the team this week as you go into conference play? Yeah, just continue to play well. Mm-hmm. Um, continue to play the right way. Like we we've always talked, we want to be going up and playing our best basketball. And even like even when we were losing, right? You go on a losing streak. Uh, there were still things that we were seeing that we were getting better, right? Like still things that myself and the staff, you know, because we see them every day. Uh, but I, I felt like we were still getting better during that time period. Um, so we want to keep doing it, right? We want to keep playing. We want to keep playing the right way. We want to keep growing in small areas um, and now do it on the road uh, in, you know, two places that, uh, you know, Louisville is actually will have a big following. Like I got a lot of family that will be there. Mm-hmm. Coach Owens is from Southern Indiana. He'll have a lot of family that's there. So we'll have a little bit of a backing there. there and then, you know, Syracuse such a unique environment. Um, you know, it'll be fun to, to go in there and play. And, you know, in both places we want to play well. Yeah, two great opportunities. Let's take a quick break and we'll bring Tay Davis in. All right, we got a special guest. 
Tay Davis has joined us on the set. Uh, Coach, I have a bunch of questions here I want to get to with you and Tay. But we were just talking, Tay and myself, before you got here, and I think we covered a couple topics I want to make sure we get on the record here. So first things first, All-Star Game. Did you watch it last night, Coach? Uh, I watched parts of the All-Star Game. Okay. Yes. You, you've coached in the NBA. Why is the All-Star Game what it is now compared to what it was when Tay and I were just talking, when you were like five or six years old growing up? It was a great game. What's changed? Why is it so different? Uh, I don't know. I think some of the players have changed. Mm -hmm. So some of the like the competitive competitiveness level has gone down. Mm. Um, I think guys are making making a lot more money. So they're protecting their money. They don't want to get hurt. Okay. Right. Um, everybody like it's it is such an honor to to be an all star and do that. But then at the same time, right, like they play games on Wednesday. Wednesday's the last day of the regular season. And then you have to be there on Thursday yeah. for events. And, like, they book you up, like, yeah. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And, like, everybody else on your team is, like, on vacation. Okay. Right? So they get a couple of days, you know, after now yeah. they leave right after the game and get a couple of days but you know it's an honor to be an all-star but you also miss like a little bit of that time where you can just like recharge your battery yeah. so tay we were talking you think a big issue is that it's like kobe and mj were wired a little differently right we were talking about i saw highlights of kobe and mj in the high in the uh, all-star game they were going at each other and it's kind of like a coach said the guys last night aren't quite wired the same way right mm, a little yeah. bit different kobe kobe is that dude, <laughs> Kobe's that dude. I think it's like it's definitely different now because like everybody is like super friends. Yeah, they're too nice off the court. They don't want to kill each other quite as much. We went uh, so last night they went back to East versus West mm. for the first time instead since of the draft, right? Two thousand seventeen. Yeah, maybe I think they switched. So Team LeBron, Team Giannis, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, so like. um the last time it was East versus West, we coached in the All Star Game. Oh, that's right, that I was us. Okay, um, and we got absolutely destroyed. It was in New Orleans, <laughs> and uh, they were trying to get Anthony Davis the MVP, and they were throwing him lobs. They were doing like he scored every point, and we just got destroyed. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, some of those guys didn't play. Like LeBron didn't play a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, it was Giannis's first All Star game. Okay, and uh, it was a little bit different. It was the funniest story. Giannis, you know, like had never been in the All Star game before, so like Giannis plays hard. Mm -hmm. Like he, you know, he didn't last night because now he he's now to this point yeah. he knows the drill. But this is his first All Star All Star game, and he goes, uh, it's like halftime, and everybody's all huddled up, and and Giannis like looks around, and he's like, we we play hard now. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys are like, yeah, 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 yeah. You play, play, you play hard. Play hard. Yeah, yeah, you take care of this big man. <laughs> the, uh, this is also our coldest moment of the week segment, I should have mentioned. So, Tay, I want to ask you, this is your first year with the team. Thinking back on this year so far, do you have a coldest moment in mind, your best moment from the year, one you think back on that you're really proud of? It's presented by Yeti, but I need to know your coldest moment of the year. Coldest moment of the year. That's tough. I got one in mind. What you got in mind? The one from the other day. The sideline inbound to Keba. You get it back, get the bucket at the end of the game. Tell me, because I talked to Coach after the game. There's 3.5 on the shot clock. Just what was going through your head on the sideline when that play came out? Uh, Really just trying to execute the best way to get a quick bucket, mm -hmm. whatever quick bucket we can get. So that's really what was just going through my mind, really. Had you guys practiced that? We practiced a little bit. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. Okay, here's what I asked him after the game. So he's on the other sideline. I saw him. He's yelling. He's saying, you know, could you tell what he wanted you to do? And did you do what he wanted you to do? Or were you guys freestyling? Or how did that come together? So I was looking over there, right? So I was, I was looking and I was like, I was trying to see what he was saying. I was like, I'm confused about to go with the flow. <laughs> I was confused, but I was just kind of going with the flow, but. End up working out, though. Yeah. So. Coach, that's the kind of play I think that in February they're making. They might not have made it in November. I don't know. Do you feel like the guys have yeah. come together and kind of maybe learned how to work on the fly a little bit better now they've all been together for a couple months? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I think 
you know, once we got, you know, I'm, I'm over there trying to get us like organized. I figured once we got organized, they would recognize what we were talking about. Uh -huh. Right. So like, as soon as Marcus went to his spot, it probably stands out mm -hmm. like, you know, what's he doing back there? Yeah. They're like, you know, so like maybe a tree, it took Braden a second. Like he didn't know exactly where to go. And then when I put him in the right spot, then he's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Now I know what we're doing. Kebba was good. Like, you know, cause we'd run it. Cause like we'd run it in the past and everything else. And now it's just kind of a read. So Tay was the last one. And I was just going to kind of point to where, where the ball should go. All right. And then from there, you know. It was a great play. It's a game-winning yeah. play, really. Uh, I want to go back to when you decided to come play here. And, Tate, tell me what it was like just when you decided to make the move to play for Coach Shrews. What went through your head? What were the conversations like? And why did you want to come play at Notre Dame this year? Um, I mean, from jump, it was really like a, a no-brainer, really. Mm -hmm. um, like before, I want to say, so when he was coaching at Purdue – and I was, I think I was like, was I a sophomore? Yeah, sophomore. Uh, junior, sophomore, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, so he was recruiting me like, back then. Yeah. So, um, like, it was a no brainer, really. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's my guy, man. What did you see in Tay? What, 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 why does he say you're his guy? What did you see I, in him? It, it's been, like, he's talked about, it's been a long, like, relationship of recruiting. Mm -hmm. Um, just watching, watching him as a young player while while watching. Um, so you know, I come back from the NBA and like um, Tay's older brother Dre, Nigel Pack, and him like we had we're on a great team at, yeah. at Lawrence Central, and uh, had an unbelievable season, regular season, and then watching these guys in the AAU that summer, um, and Dre had. Dre had already committed to Nebraska, mm. and then he, he kind of opened up his uh, – okay. or he decommitted. And we came and did a home visit uh, when I was at Purdue. So our mm. staff did a home visit. So we got a chance to – you know, his dad's a, a Indianapolis legend. He's right? get like, there, yeah. Uh, so, so we had known his dad, known his family, and, and um, you know, so it's just – like for the longest time, I've been recruiting him. Yeah, but I never got a chance to coach him. Mm. And uh, now this this opportunity is has kind of presented itself, and you know it's been great. Okay, let's talk about your dad then. So you played for your dad. So yeah. I first want to know what's that experience like playing for your dad? Because you're sitting next to somebody who's coaching his son right now. I just I'm always fascinated by this dynamic. So what was the experience like for you? So I know exactly how Brain probably feels sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly. So it's it's tough sometimes, but it's a blessing, you know. What I'm saying? Sure. And like, especially looking back at it, it's it's a blessing. It was fun. Uh, like so, my freshman and sophomore year, um, he still coached me as an assistant coach at Lawrence Central, mm -hmm. and then my junior and senior year, he was my head coach. Right. So, uh, it was fun though. So, was there a time when it wasn't fun? Though? It was definitely yeah. It was a lot of times <laughs> where it was tough. Like it was like man, but. But everything prevailed, though. Everything yeah. just, it got better. So Does it feel, though, like the that dad or when, when dad is coach, he's harder on you? Did it ever feel like that? Because I get the sense like there's almost pressure for the coach mm -hmm. to be harder on their son so it doesn't look like to everyone else that they're getting a pass. Did you find that? No, for sure. Okay. Always. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like they're pushing you. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? They're pushing you. So, um I uh, guess yeah, it's, it's a blessing, though. Like I said, so it's but it's fun at the end of the day. Yeah, is it? It's that fun. sounds kind of like what you can relate to, at least on the other end of this spectrum, a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it is it, like it, it is like, um, I I don't like some of the things like you know he he he'll say it, and I know his dad, and his dad's a good coach. Right, his dad's a great person, but he also is like he's gonna get on these guys. Yeah. When, when they need it, um, and the same thing, yeah. like you know, with Braden and I's relationship, like, yeah. I get on them a few times as well. Sure. Yeah, yeah sure. every once in a while, but it it will be fine. Yeah, right. Um, at some point in time. <laughs> at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it last week, like when it's all done, when you look back on it, yeah. that, that'll be yeah. the fun part. Yeah. yeah, Indianapolis. We were talking a little bit about Indy before we started here. The fact that you're a couple hours away has to be nice. Just what about this state? This state is a huge basketball state, Tay. Just growing up playing college or high school hoops here, now playing uh, college hoops here. What about this state makes it fun being close to home and getting a chance to play in the state of Indiana? 
But I mean, like, like you said, like Indiana is a super big basketball state. So mm-hmm. like even in high school, like the LCLN games, the Warren Central LC or LN is yeah. packed. Like it's always packed, standing room only, hmm. and not even that. So it's like it's always been fun playing in Indiana. Yeah. So being close and being in Indiana is fun for me. Try to, because you you've been around the state recruiting it and all that. You know the high school scene. I frankly, being out here, I've not gotten a chance to really dive into it. Just can you explain to me how intense Indiana high school basketball really is? And like he lived it, you know, playing yeah. it as well. No, it. it um, <clears throat> so I, you know, it's ironic that we're playing Louisville. I grew up right across the bridge from Louisville in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Okay, yeah. And like we had season tickets to our high school, right? Wow. Like it wasn't like there was like a there's like a pageantry to it, right? There was like a, a draw where you had to like go in in the school auditorium and they like pull the number out and that's when you got to go pick your seats. Like it was like a huge deal. Yeah. And then like you watched Hoosiers, it's like the whole town travels. Like they that's what we did. Yeah. We went to all the games and, and traveled. And, you know, then we moved to Indianapolis and it's a bigger city. There's a lot more going on. But like he said, there's – you know, you go to some of these games and, you know, it's Lawrence North and Lawrence Central and like, which I went to this year and mm-hmm. it's packed. Like, um, even the games here, like, you know, having a kid that's playing high school and going to St. Joe's and the yeah. Marion game last week and it's packed. Like, the, the, there's such a like pageantry to, um, high school basketball here and the fandom and everything else. And, uh, like yesterday was the, sectional draw you know, yeah which is like it's a big deal in high school it's like you know it's a tv get. production and you see who plays and you know i i have you know i actually obviously you know still have a kid playing so i'm interested to know what they're doing but like i watched the entire thing yeah. i just took you know an hour to an hour and a half out of my day to watch like the class a southern you know sectional 48 down in <laughs> southern indiana and like who's orleans gonna play like that's great. you know just watching that whole deal so uh it starts there it starts in high school and then obviously the the college and then um the nba with the pacers there's there's just such a love for basketball it's fun yeah okay so now follow up i'm thinking of here high school you can't include yourself tay who is the best player you've seen in indiana high school basketball can you someone you played against or that you've seen, maybe you were growing up, that you watched in Indiana high school basketball. It's honestly a lot of them, I and it's it's it's. Um, you can give me a couple if you want. So, when I was when I was coming up, I always so my pops was coaching at LC, so, um, like I looked up to guys that was playing at LC, like Jeremy Hollowell, um, Tyler Fisher, was like a whole bunch of different guys mm-hmm. that's coming out of LC. I looked up to them. Um, then from Warren you had Devin Davis. Okay. And then um from Jeffersonville you had um Romeo Langford. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Chris Wilkes. Thanks. There's a whole bunch of guys. And then like my brother and Nigel coming up before me, I looked up to those guys. Right. Uh coming up and stuff. I was always trying to do what they was doing. So. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of guys though that I, that I think is like great okay. coming out of Indiana. All right, coach, you've got maybe a broader history here yeah. in the state. So why don't yeah. you give me uh well, you can give me some names that come to mind. Just who you've seen play, who comes uh, to mind, I think, of Indiana basketball. And this is, like you said, I got a broader, I got a broader sense of this just yeah. because, like, we grew up going to, like, all the state championship games. Right. Um, but, so, Jefferson, in Jeffersonville's conference, um, I got to watch Damon Bailey play high school for four years. Wow. Right? Like, yeah. he was in the same conference, so – like, you know, the all time leading scorer in Indiana high school basketball. Yeah. He was he was so good from freshman year through. Mm-hmm. Um we moved to Indianapolis. My sister went to Lawrence North when Eric okay. Montross was there. Really? Oh wow. So I got to see Eric Montross play in high school up close. Um I went to the state championship games. Glenn Robinson against Alan Henderson Glenn in the Robinson. state championship game was unbelievable. Wow. Um I saw Sean Kemp play in high school. That's my guy. Chandler Seattle. Thompson. Uh, Chandler Thompson, Muncie Central, was unbelievable. Uh, then, like, as I went through, 
Like there were that. I mean, the other day, well, uh, Georgia Tech staff, Bonzi Wells, unbelievable. Oh, unbelievable I couldn't believe player. Bonzi Wells was on the staff. I was, you know, Bonzi, you know Bonzi Wells, Wells yeah. Oh, yeah. I, sure. I felt so sure. old playing against Bon. I, I played against Bonzi. You played against Bonzi in high school in AAU. Like unbelievable player. Um, and then like when I started coaching, and and I've seen like there were so many good players, right? Like in going coming through Indianapolis. When I started coaching, I remember going back. I may have been in college. Maybe it was before I started coaching, but coming back and going to the Hinkle Regional okay. and seeing Eric Gordon play for the first time. Oh, oh my goodness. I forgot to miss him. Oh, uh, he, he was so good. Uh, Mike Conley. Conley. I saw Mike Conley at the Top 40 workout. I didn't they, realize he was one. They don't have it anymore, uh, um, but they had the Top 40 workout, which is the best 40 high school seniors in Indiana. And Greg Oden didn't play, mm. right? Like, he didn't need to play. Because Everyone obviously, <laughs> yeah. But Mike Conley was it, he was going half speed, and he was still faster than everybody else out there on the court. Like yeah. he was that, so that, good. that 2008 Ohio State team. Yeah, pretty good. They had some players. So yeah, I've I've gone through the history of Indiana high school basketball and that, but and there's still like other guys that are just tremendous yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Tay, have you seen like Sean Kemp mixtapes highlights? You know about his I mean, work. I know, I know about him a little bit. I don't watch like a whole lot, though. Oh man! So I grew up in Seattle. Like Gary Payton, Sean Kemp, Detlef Shrimp, Hersey Hawkins. Like those are the guys. I mean, Sean Kemp. Just, just YouTube. When you get out of here, just YouTube Sean Kemp as you walk to class or if you're going. Like there's some crazy mixtapes. I mean, the dunk on Austin Lister and oh. then hitting with the, this right here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Sean that's, Kemp. That's from, a, Sean Kemp went to Concord. He was like, like the Rain Man. Elkhart. That's an old school Right move, next door. Yeah, yeah. You don't like that's this? A, that's an old school move. Yeah, let me tell you something. Next time you boom on somebody, right there. No, I got you. That's, no, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. That's no technical either. He just <laughs> right my man's face right there and then ran back down the court like nothing happened. <laughs> that's was, my next signature right there. <laughs> do it. Do it. You owe me that. Oh, man. Uh, okay, last question before I get you out of here is just let's talk a little bit of hoops going forward. You guys got a couple weeks left. The season's kind of winding down. It's kind of crazy. But you guys, I think, have grown a lot this year, Tay. Just what are you kind of hoping to accomplish here in the last couple weeks of the regular season before you guys go to D.C. for the ACC tournament? Uh, we're trying to just be the best team that we can, that Notre Dame can be. Mm -hmm. If we're the best version of ourselves, then, like, the sky is the limit for us mm -hmm. for the next games to come. So just trying to be the best of us and continue to get better every day. For you, Coach, we've talked about Tay a good amount on the radio show for sure before uh, broadcast, but – what about his game excites you? What's he done? I think he's taken a lot of strides throughout the year. Yeah, no, he has. Um, you know, I, in the – probably last week or before that, I talked about, like, you know, how good of a defender he is and, mm. and his versatility on the defensive end of the floor and, like, how good he's been in that area. Um, and then I don't – they probably, if you ask them all, like, I have all these one-liners in practice or I'll say different <laughs> things. But I said something to him Saturday in practice, and it, like, rings true. It's like, <clears throat> uh, you don't need permission to be a great player. Okay. Right? Yeah. And that's a, that's what I think he can be. Right? He can, he can be a really good player for us. And, like, his ability to, you know, attack people off the dribble and yeah. get to the rim and score and rebound and make plays and pass, like, all those things. And uh, I think you – you're seeing him make those strides and make those steps, and you know we want to continue to grow that yeah. for the rest of this year and throughout the rest of his career. You don't need permission to be a great player, and you don't need permission to hit him with this <laughs> the next time you get a dunk. <laughs> All right, thanks that's a technical waiting to happen, by the way. So hey, if it happens, you blame I'm me. Pointing <laughs> right at you. you blame me. <laughs> <laughs> Tay, thanks for coming by, man. Appreciate it. Today too. All right. All right, we now have a very special guest joining us for the first time on Wake Up the Echoes. A long time coming, in my opinion, and we've been kind of waiting to use this special guest, Lafonso Ellis, joining us for the first time. Lafonso, thanks for taking the time today. Uh, first of all, how are you doing, and how excited are you to be joining us on Wake Up the Echoes today? Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure. I appreciate you having me on. Excited uh, you know how much I love our University and certainly our men's basketball program, and so always delighted to be able to chime in from time to time. So I'm honored to be on. Thank you for having me. 
I uh, was doing some research, going back to look at your playing days, and I found a Chicago Tribune article from 1987. It said, Ellis shuns Illinois to go to Notre Dame. Uh, really interesting article about how you ended up coming here and, and you had some good quotes in there. I want you to tell the listeners who might not be familiar with your time back then. There's some younger listeners on this show. Back then, why did you decide to come to Notre Dame? Well, I didn't want to go through the craziness of the recruiting process. And so I decided to narrow my options early. And those options were Illinois and Notre Dame in the Midwest, Syracuse in the East, and UCLA in the West. And I, I just, you know, Coach Phelps made a tremendous impact uh, on me during his times that he would visit both my home and my school, my high school. And just knowing that going to Notre Dame, I'd have the opportunity for my family to be able to see me play at any time because any of our games that weren't on CBS or NBC during that time, everything else was carried on WGN and or Sports Channel. All of, all of those uh, channels could be seen by my family who was spread all throughout uh, Southern Illinois. I'm from East St. Louis, Illinois, so they were in and around that area. And to be able to go to a university that was a small university, my hometown's uh, quite small, small in its heyday. I think it had around 70,000 people in it. Um, during my high school time, it was probably around 35, maybe 40. And so I think going to a university that had, you know, at that time, 9,000 total students that had a global brand, even back then, before we even talked about things like global branding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it ended up being the right place for me. I visited Syracuse and um, grateful for Jim Beheim and his staff for recruiting me, uh, but I just didn't feel like it was a good fit. I actually was going to go to UCLA. Uh, my good friend Derek Martin uh, was going to be the starting point guard to, uh, to take over for Pooh Richardson, who was a tremendous guard at the time. It was going to be the starting point guard, so I had entertained very heavily going to UCLA. Then mom said, uh, babe, can you stay closer to home? And I just felt Notre Dame was the perfect place for me, so I made that decision. Let's talk about some of the years you had here. You had a couple of NCAA tournament appearances early in your career. Then I looked at your numbers. You averaged a double-double as a senior. When you think back to your time in South Bend, what are the moments that stick out? What are the flashbulb memories about playing for the Irish? Oh, man. Uh, Coach... Coach Phelps put together a tremendous schedule every year. We were independent at that time. And so the goal, to, there were two things. He wanted to put together a strong strength of schedule. And he always felt that we could win 20 games as an independent with that type of schedule that we were uh, automatically going to get into the NCAA tournament. And so having the opportunity to come and play for him, uh, he's. I, I say all the time that in a situation where you're up five, down five, uh, with five minutes to go in the game, and I've had the privilege of playing for the great Pat Riley, Flip Saunders, uh, Lenny Wilkins when I was in the NBA. Um, I'm going with Coach Digger Phelps every single time. He was <laughs> No, he was extraordinary when it came to strategy. And uh, with regard to that, uh, yeah, you come to the University of Notre Dame as an independent, and I'm playing against UCLA out west, USC. Both of those teams were top 25 during that time. We would come to the Midwest and play against Indiana, Kentucky, of course, Marquette and DePaul were really good during that time. And we played Michigan, the start of the Fab Five, my senior season. We go out east and we play against St. John's and North Carolina and Duke and Georgia Tech. And so to be able, as a former McDonald's All-American, to be able to come to a school like Notre Dame that was known as a football school and be able to play that type of schedule year in and year out, uh, it, it was the, the schedule was, was phenomenal and I was – thrilled to be able to play against that kind of competition for I was academically ineligible twice so it was really three years of my career at Notre Dame. I wanted to ask you about your ring of honor ceremony I think it was a couple years ago with a Kentucky game uh when Notre Dame had that dramatic win over number 10 Kentucky sure your speech at halftime and you had a ton of teammates there what did your teammates mean to you while you were here you went out of your way to thank them it just seemed like you, they had a tremendous impact on you and you wanted to make sure that they were part of that day where your name and number went up into the rafters? When you, when you have an opportunity that way, whether it's the military, whether, whether it's in sport, even in family, uh, when you're trying to build a team and you all are trying to get out to the same goal, it, it, you, you create these deep uh, connections with the guys uh, during that time uh, that, that I was there. And usually when individual honors come up, especially in team sport, 
unless you, he, even the great Michael Jordan, he had Scottie Pippen and Horace Grant, then Dennis Rodman and all of those guys. So all of the individual accolades that he received, uh, he, he certainly deserved them, but none of them would have been possible without his teammates. Elmer Bennett sacrificing a bit of his scoring to be able to find me inside to be able to score likewise with Damon Sweet, Joe Frederick and uh, Jameer Jackson and Scott Paddock and Keith Robinson before those guys, Keith Tower, obviously uh, in my senior class. And so I thought it was important to express to them that, yes, God created this great moment in time for me and my family to be celebrated in that way. But I wanted them to know that uh, God's grace extended to them also, that any time that they would come to campus and look up in the rafters and see old number 20 up there, that they had an opportunity. They, they played a huge part in that. And I, I, I really wanted that to be the um, well, secondarily, uh, the, the second message of the weekend to my teammate, teammates who I still have deep, deep relationships with and wanted them to feel very, marked, very much a part of that whole thing, not only for that night, but of course going forward. You know, I haven't had a chance to talk to you much about your NBA experience. My first exposure to you on a national stage was growing up in Seattle as a Sonics fan. <laughs> you think about 1994 and you and Dikembe Mutombo kind of ruining the number one seed that year. Sure. I think it was 11, 12 years in the NBA, over 600 games just playing in the NBA. I mean, it's the dream of quite frankly, anybody that ever touches a basketball, I think. Yes. I dreamed about it at one point. A lot of people, <laughs> it didn't work out for me, obviously. Uh, just what was that experience like? What did you take away from your time in the NBA uh, that when you think back to it what was was so impactful and profound in your life? Well, I have to go back to Notre Dame being a springboard for that. Uh, played three years under Coach Phelps, and then Coach McLeod came in my senior year and kind of changed the way that we played. We played more of an NBA up-tempo style, and uh, he just taught me so much to mentally get me prepared for that grind and to be the number five pick in 1992 from a traditional football school. Again, goes back to – uh, the guy, Orlando Hampton, who taught me how to play the game when I was a, a boy. And the input or the, the deposits that Coach Phelps made during the three years I played for him and certainly capped off by all that John McLeod taught me my senior year and to play with. People, I think people forget that Elmer Damon and Keith Tower were, in today's terms, were all top 100 players. Mm -hmm. And to have a chance to play with and against those guys day in and day out, all of that prepared me for that next step, which was going to be the NBA. And to be able to play against, <clears throat> I, I was sandwiched between two great classes and being recruited and, and, and was part of a great class. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my class included Shaquille O'Neal was the first pick. Alonzo Mourning was second. Christian Leitner, then Jim Jackson. Uh, we have, I think, what, 13, national, 13 world championships in that group that was drafted. And then the sandwich between Michael Jordan, Charles Barkley, um, Hakeem Olajuwon, uh, John Stockton, Patrick Ewing on one end, and then on the other end, uh, by the time my fourth season rolled around, now here comes Kobe and KG yeah. and Tracy McGrady and and Allen Iverson and all of that guy, those guys. So I felt I had an opportunity to play during the golden years of the NBA because uh, night in and night out, uh, there were no dog teams and certainly no dog players because they were uh, dispersed all throughout the league. The great Cl Clyde Drexler, of course, uh, in Portland, Sean Kemp and Gary Payton, your Seattle Supersonics. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a great time to be able to play, and I loved being able to play against that high level of, of competition and uh, to actually have some success to make history as the first number eight seed to be the number one seed in 1994 were certainly the capper <laughs> for me personally. Yeah, you caught the Sonics before that 96 season. I think that 96 team, if not for, of course, the 96 Bulls, it's one of the best NBA teams, at least that I've seen. 64 wins. It was it was a great yeah. to be in Seattle growing up. We had Jordan Cornette on the show earlier this year, talked to him recently, and he told me that when he was growing up watching games, even before he got to this level of college hoops, he was focused sure. on the broadcasters. He would take note of what they were saying. He was trying to maybe prepare for a career after sports. And his career came earlier than yours because he was not playing professionally in the NBA. Sure. What was your process to getting into broadcasting? When did you first maybe take an interest to it? Was it at that young of an age like Jordan did? Or was it later along the line that you finally found in yourself that, hey, I might want to get into 
a role where I'm talking about the game when I'm done playing it. Yeah, I, I had never really get, given it much thought. <clears throat> excuse me, my, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Tony, I'm sorry. Uh, my my story is a little, little bit different in that uh, during that time we talked about the Supersonics. So in the NBA, uh, if you made it to the playoffs and you were considered one of the star players that would lose in your series, then uh, TBT, TNT, CNN, late nights with Vince Cellini, obviously joining yeah. Ernie and the guys, uh, they would invite you to be part of their coverage. And so for many years after, so that year, 94, after we lost to Utah in game seven of the second round, uh, they invited me down to do some work with them. And so there's a guy unbeknownst to me named Maury Gostrand who had saw me do work uh, like that for the balance of my career. And so he actually thought I had a little bit of talent and could do it. So he reached out to me, I think in 2004, after I had retired and asked if I'd be interested in doing it. And I said, uh, I was, I'd battled back from injury and for so many years, I was just tired. And so I took six years off and I reconnected. Long story short, the Lord opened up an opportunity for me. And uh, it started with Jack Nolan. Uh, Jack reached out to me on a whim one day and was like, hey, would you at all, he and I have been great friends for a long time. Would you at all be interested in joining me on the Notre Dame radio broadcast? <laughs> and I was like, interesting that you should call Jack because uh, uh, through a process of prayer and other we uh, felt led to move from Minneapolis to South Bend, and he called us at the very beginning of that. And so did a couple of years of Jack Nolan, who's one of my great friends, and that was fun uh, in doing that, and then uh, joining ESPN in, in, in 09. And, uh, but it all goes back to having had those uh, opportunities to be able to serve in that same way with TNT and TBS and CNN that kind of created the kind of desire or love for. And I've kind of always wanted to kind of do a little radio TV because I've always been kind of comfortable with it. Thanks to Coach Phelps, who taught me how to be comfortable in front of a camera my freshman year. Yeah, that's true. I guess you're on the same show that he was for so long. Uh, yeah. With Jack, I, I had to ask you about Jack because I asked Jordan about him. Jordan said, I thought it was interesting, I never heard him say that, he thinks Jack's name should go up in the rafters at Purcell Pavilion because of how impactful he's been for the program. I, of course, am sitting in his seat now after he's retired great yeah. mentor for me and has meant so much just to not just Notre Dame basketball, but to the entire university. Sure. What was the experience like working with him? You called him a great friend, uh, especially starting in broadcasting. That's a unique spot when you're going to, you know, really start taking it seriously. How did Jack help you as you went on to pursue this career? Yeah, Jack, Jack was great. Uh, first of all, just with radio alone, he, he's really good at explaining, you know, what the roles are between a color commentator and, play-by-play -play. and in radio technically the play-by-play -play is the star because they are the voice of um, my job is to add a, an additional layer as an analyst uh, <laughs> as soon as the ball goes through the basket and until it gets the half court is my time to really explain what just happened be there. quick <laughs> <laughs> and so and so your job is to tell the what and my job is to very quickly say the why and uh, you know those little things like that you know, are impactful for a guy who's kind of a more of a more of a visual learner. And so, if you tell me something and you kind of paint a picture, I, I get it pretty quickly. And then uh, from there, uh, he, he once I told him that uh, ESPN wanted to bring me on. Uh, he and I met over at the JACC in his office, and we just put a tape in, and we began calling the game. And so. He told me a couple of additional things that would be helpful. He's like, now, Fonz, he said, it's, it's going to be different for you for TV because it's the opposite on TV. The color guy is the star, if you will, of that. You'll have much more time to be able to uh, tell the people what happened. And, um, and so all of those little seeds uh, he planted in me that put me in good position to be able to go handle my interview well, and um, and obviously be able to work for uh, the best media company or the most famous media company of all time in terms of sport in the ESPN. And now, of course, I transitioned over to Fox and all of what, J what Jack taught me back then has uh, impacted my ability to uh, seem to have seamlessly um, merged into this group of, of new media family. Yeah. Jordan uh, mentioned, and, and we talked to him about a video I saw from 2012 when you would have been in town calling the game for ESPN and he was maybe just starting or had been doing it for a couple of years with Jack on radio. 
there's a great interview with the two of you kind of talking about how you both approached your career at the time and so much has changed in the 12 years since the video. Sure. But just what's it been like to see him carve out his career? Because he spoke really highly of you kind of maybe laying out a path and seeing someone that had gone to Notre Dame, gone on to be a broadcaster was helpful for him. And he said, you're a great resource when he was at ESPN. What's it been like to see Jordan have the career he has and really crediting you with at least being helpful along the way? Yeah. Jordan's way too generous. I had zero to do with that. It's, it's Jordan's willingness to work at it and work hard. I, I think he's unique actually in our sport. And I told him, I told him this a long time ago is for a guy to be able to come and learn uh, off camera. He knows every single aspect of it off camera. And then you bring him on camera. He's got such a beautiful presence about him, a command about him without being uh, overly so. And uh, to be able to play a dual role where he can be both you, Tony, as the play-by-play -play, uh, in a given night, and then all of a sudden flip it, and then it all, and then he also becomes a game analyst, and he's really good at both of them. I just feel he's a very valuable uh, piece, and I think was slightly overlooked at ESPN just in terms of the value that he brings because he's all. He, and in the third layer of it, he's excellent at being a host. And I think that's part of the reason why he's been so successful at Notre Dame, bringing him back and being part of some of the major breaking events like the hiring of Michael Shrewsbury. I don't think you can find anyone more talented. Jordan is a super talented, highly intellectual, uh, yet humble soul that really gets after it, gets people. He's super relational, tells great stories. And to me, uh, I, I in, in terms of what we do, out of our university, there could be some people go, I don't know about that one, but I, I think he's the uh, greatest talent to come out of our university in terms of our sports media wow. space. He's that's incredible. high praise. Two more before we take a quick break. The first one's just about uh, this team this year. You had a chance to be around them a little bit more by nature of everything, and you got to call the game at Milwaukee as well, seeing them against Marquette. Sure. So you've just been around this group and Coach Shrewsbury in his first season. Uh, it's, of course, you know, a unique situation. We have to build the program back up. Yes. What excites you, though, about Coach Shrewsbury and what he is building in South Bend? Because there is an excitement level that's palpable when you walk into the gym. I know you've been to plenty of home games this year to see it. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's so much. <laughs> there, there's so much that I'm excited for about what Micah uh, has brought. Uh, and, and part of it is one thing that you – we what's the weakness of our team is we just don't shoot it very well. But to have a team that's as young as they are to buy into the defensive end, that, that's unheard of because oftentimes, especially, especially as a player individually, your desire to play defense is motivated by your ability to be able to put the basketball in the hole. <laughs> and oftentimes, if you miss a shot, uh, you, you go back down on the defensive end and you're just kind of there, not locked in, versus when you make a shot, and all of a sudden you sprint back and you're down the stands and you're kind of ready to go. He's been able to get this young group to buy into all of the basic principles to become a really good defensive team uh, in terms of uh, the communication aspect of it, where they need to be positionally, in terms of our scrambling. Uh, and, and I think I, I'm so proud of this young team and how they've been willing to sit out and guard because defense, you don't know if you're going to have a cold night or a hot night. The one thing that you can do that that you can, that's that that travels well is your ability to be able to guard for this young team to be in the top 50 in terms of defensive efficiency it's pretty darn impressive and um and if you can combine that with a night where we can get hot from three and now all of a sudden we start to get some wins but uh michael shrewsbury and his staff i couldn't be more proud of those guys and what they've been able to establish in a long time in such yeah. a short time and the future is extremely bright for, for our program, and I'm proud to be Yeah, if we're only behind Virginia defensively, it's usually a good sign in the conference. <laughs> Last one before we take a <laughs> quick break. Good. This is someone I, something I ask everybody that's either a current or former Notre Dame student that comes on this show. It's an important question. Did you prefer North or South Dining Hall when you were here? It's not close. Oh. South Dining Hall. In fact, I position myself right next to it and living at Fisher Hall. Oh. <laughs> it's not close. See, I, I found that with everyone, <laughs> it's simply a proximity game. It's just what was closest. Where can yeah. I roll out of bed and get my food? That's what you've prioritized. Now, to be fair now, we're talking over 30 years ago. <laughs> South Dining Hall was much bigger, much more populated, had a lot more <laughs> availability. Now, I don't, I don't know what it's like now because I've not been to North mm. Campus. 
Uh, but, but South Baton Hill has always been the All right. Bomb. I'm a North guy, <laughs> but I respect your opinion, even if it's wrong. We'll, we'll take a quick break and come back with our final From the Irish question. All right, here we go. It's time for our From the Irish segment presented by TireRack.com. LaFonzo, we always have someone write in. Plenty of questions for you, of course, this week. This is the one that we selected. It's a unique one. It's from Dustin from Portland, Oregon. Wow. Okay. He said, do you remember the freshman swimming test in the old Rockney Memorial? One of my favorite moments was as a lifeguard at Notre Dame and helping you make the full length of the pool. You were so humble and grateful for the help of the lifeguards. We were very proud of you. He wants to know, do you remember that moment? Uh, I, I absolutely do. And uh, he said, being humble, easy to be humble when you're afraid that you're going to drown. <laughs> But no, I don't know if it still exists, but back then it was a requirement for all freshmen to be able to pass a swimming uh, a swimming test, and I couldn't swim. And so, unfortunately, I had to go through the entire semester uh, and, and have swim class. And the most challenging part of that is we had swim class on game days. And so oftentimes going into game days, my legs were incredibly fatigued. So it was a really challenging time uh, for me, but it built, it built mental toughness because there's, there's no excuse for going out on the floor and not being able to perform. So please tell him I said, thanks again. And, uh, and that was being able to swim the full length and back. That, that, that I wish I would have been able to do it on the first day so I wouldn't have to go have gone through it. <laughs> but please thank you, Dustin, for saving me during that time and being a, a safety net for me while I swam the two laps. A big shout out to Dustin for helping you back in the late 80s, early 90s. <laughs> Fonz, thanks so much for doing this. Great to have you. You are held in such high regard around here. Everyone has amazing things to say about you. I can only echo those sentiments. Uh, thanks for everything you've done for Notre Dame and the basketball program. We'll keep watching you on Fox, calling those games, and we hope to see you back on campus soon down the stretch here. Praise God. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for having me on, Tony. That does it for this week's episode of Wake Up the Echoes, presented by TireRack.com. Thanks, as always, to the head coach, Michael Shrewsbury, and thanks to Tay Davis and LaFonzo Ellis for joining us this week. As always, please download and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasting content. Go to the YouTube page, give us a like or subscribe. And remember, you can always go to FightingIrish.com slash Wake Up to submit a question for our special guests each and every week. We'll talk to you next week on Wake Up the Echoes.